Okay, so I'm gonna start, go back in time. So about 25 years ago, I was working as a young architect in San Francisco, um, redesigning the retrofit of the um, architecture campus at Berkeley. It was a dream job is where I went to school. And um, I had a colleague who told me about the carbon impact of building materials and you can change the carbon footprint of cement by, or concrete by adding fly ash and some other things to it. Uh, we worked on this project and I thought, that's, that's, I, I think I could try and do that. I talked to the structural engineer on that project and I said, have you heard about this fly ash stuff? Can we put it in the concrete and uh, change the carbon footprint in the concrete? And nobody told us we could do this. It was for the you know, state of California. We like called up the contractor and said, can we, can we do this? And they said, only in the foundations. I'm like, good, we could, but we can do the foundations. Yes, we can do the foundations. Uh, so we got it through and it went, went through and I, I, I did some calculations. Like, I wrote the notes down. What, how much carbon footprint, how much carbon did I save in that? And I did the calculations and it was like, then I said, well, oh, that's some big number. I don't know how big that number is. And then I'm like, well, what does that compare to? And I, so I looked at car driving and I was like, it compares to more than my commute my entire life. I thought, oh, cool. I, I, can, I can make my a decision in the buildings that I work on that are way higher impact than the personal choices that I can make. But I had no clue if those numbers were right. Um, and the building got built and, and, and there it goes. And so uh, as, as I worked in practice for about 15 years, the issue of the carbon emissions from building materials came up as a recurring question. And when I had the opportunity to get a faculty position at the University of Washington, I teach structures to architects, that's my, my, my day job. And my um, afternoon job of, uh, as a researcher has really been diving in to understand the uh, environmental impact from manufacturing building materials and products. So that was 25 years ago. 25 years from now is going to be 2045, and we've solved climate change. We've come down um, in the North America, we're all at zero greenhouse gas emission target, right? And we're teaching the rest of the world how to do that the way that we've learned how to do it. So that's, but it doesn't feel that long ago when I was 25, and, and you know, I'm going to be 75. So what's going to happen in there? We've got to make a massive shift in how we're thinking about the built environment, and it has to be driven by science-based targets. 25 years ago, I was willing to say things like, well, that sounds hard. I'm not sure how we'll get there. 2050 is a long way away. Well, 2050 is not a long way away. It is hard, but we're the people that can figure it out. So we know how to make net zero carbon buildings today. We know that it's challenging to do it, but we know how to do it. So we need to just do it. We no longer can claim it's a green building unless it's a net zero carbon operating building, in my opinion. So you just, you, other than that, you're trying but not hard enough. So then the second part is there's the next frontier, which is the emissions from manufacturing building materials. Buildings built today between now and, and 2050, arguably more than half of their impact is from making them, especially since you're all making net zero carbon operating buildings. So then well, how do we get decarbonizing the material sector? You can do it in three different ways. One is you reuse buildings. Love this, right? You take a building that was probably clunky and ugly and now make it absolutely stunning and delightful. The second way that you can do that is you look at changing, uh, do you agree with me? But there's a bunch of clunky buildings in Atlanta that yeah. put a lot of sunk yeah. carbon in them. So make those buildings delightful and exciting. Then, then you figure out how you can do trade-offs between systems. So you can, that's where all of the discussion is about, should we build more mass timber buildings? Why aren't we building straw bale walls in our commercial office buildings? Why aren't we storing carbon in the building materials that we use? So there's a lot of opportunities for innovation, new bamboo manufacturing coming on. In order to take new building, new, new novel materials and systems to market, we have to take risks. But we have to take risks if we're gonna meet global climate change targets. And the third way of addressing embodied carbon is through specification and procurement. I know I'm buying aluminum. Am I getting the lowest carbon footprint aluminum available on the market today? How about my carpet? How about my concrete? How about my steel? So the EC3 tool has been developed uh, through the Carbon Leadership Forum. I didn't even tell you what that was. The, so the Carbon Leadership Forum is a group of people focused on embodied carbon or the reduction of embodied carbon, and we develop research and um, resources and uh, uh, collaborate on initiatives. So the EC3 tool is one of these uh, super exciting um, initiatives. We got nearly 50 partners coming together. Perkins and Will was one of the early pilot sponsors. Uh, we have the shared theme of research, uh, practice-inspired research and research-informing practice. That's why I'm practicing. Uh, that's why I'm researching. 
Uh, and the EC3 tool allows you to look and see what products are available on the market today and understand their carbon footprint and decide whether or not you can specify the low carbon option. There's, it's not all perfect, but if we can allow industry to transform, so this means steel mills have to be more efficient and they need to change their electrical sourcing. It means new ways of making cement. These are not easy things to happen. And those industrial sectors have a hard time justifying changing their pro manufacturing processes unless the, man the market tells them that they want it or demand it. We, the building sector is the largest consumer of products in the world. If we set the standard that we are not gonna buy dirty products, or at least by 2030, we're not gonna buy dirty products, we'll give you 10 years. Tell us what you got today, be transparent. But be good by 2030. That's the kind of signal that market um, needs to be able to invest. And there's really exciting low carbon materials available today. They aren't getting specified because they have risk. We have to help our clients know that they can accept these risks because the risks of not meeting global climate targets are way worse than uh, a cracked paver in your front lawn. So uh, we can, uh, there's my seven minutes. <laughs>